Let's open up to uh, Genesis 41, page 36 in the Pew Bibles. At the end of two years, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing beside the Nile when seven healthy-looking, well-fed cows came up from the Nile and began to graze among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, sickly and thin, came up from the Nile and stood beside those cows along the bank of the Nile. The sickly, thin cows ate the healthy, well-fed cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep and dreamed a second time. Seven heads of grain, plump and good, came up on one stalk. After them, seven heads of grain, thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven plump full ones. Then Pharaoh woke up, and it was only a dream. When morning came, he was troubled. So he summoned all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today I remember my faults. Pharaoh was angry with his servants, and he put me and the chief baker in the custody of the captain of the guards. He and I had dreams on the same night. Each dream had its own meaning. Now a young Hebrew... A slave of the captain of the guards was with us there. He told him, we we told him our dreams. He interpreted our dreams for us and each had its own interpretation. It turned out just the way he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position and the other was hanged. Then Pharaoh sent for Joseph and they quickly brought him from the dungeon. He shaved, changed his clothes and went to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said about you that you can hear a dream and interpret it. Can we read this bit together? This is the memory verse. Ready? Let's do this together. I am not able to, Joseph answered Pharaoh. It is God who will give Pharaoh a favourable answer. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, In my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile. When seven well-fed, healthy-looking cows came up from the Nile and grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, weak, very sickly and thin, came up. I've never seen such sickly ones as these in all the land of Egypt. Then the thin, sickly cows ate the first seven well-fed cows. When they had devoured them, you could not tell that they had devoured them. Their appearance was as bad as it had been before. Then I woke up. In my dream, I also saw seven heads of grain, full and good, coming up on one stalk. After them, seven heads of grain, withered, thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up. The thin heads of grain swallowed the seven good ones. I told this to the magicians, but no one can tell me what it means. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams mean the same thing. The seven thin, sickly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven worthless, scorched heads of grain are seven years of famine. It is just as I told Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt. After them, seven years of famine will take place and all the abundance in the land of Egypt will be forgotten. The famine will devastate the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because of the famine that follows it, for the famine will be very severe. Since the dream was given twice to Pharaoh, It means that the matter has been determined by God and he will carry it out soon. So now, let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this. Let him appoint overseers over the land and take a fifth of the harvest of the land of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. Let them gather all the excess food during these good years that are coming. 
under Pharaoh's authority, store the grain in the cities so they may preserve it as food. The food will be a reserve for the land during the seven years of famine that will take place in the land of Egypt. Then the country will not be wiped out by the famine. The proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants, and he said to them, Can we find anyone like this, a man who has God's spirit in him? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one as discerning and wise as you are. You will be over my house, and all my people will obey your commands. Only I, as king, will be greater than you. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, See, I am placing you over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, clothed him with fine linen garments, and placed a gold chain around his neck. He had Joseph ride in his second chariot, and servants called out before him, Make way! So he placed him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and no one will be able to raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt without your permission. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name zaphnath paneah and gave him a wife, Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, priest at On. And Joseph went throughout the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Joseph left Pharaoh's presence and travelled throughout the land of Egypt. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced outstanding harvests. Joseph gathered all the excess food in the land of Egypt during the seven years and put it in the cities. He put the food in every city from the fields around it. So Joseph stored up grain in such abundance, like the sand of the sea, that he stopped measuring it because it was beyond measure. Two sons were born to Joseph before the years of famine arrived. Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, priest at On, bore them to him. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh and said, God has made me forget all my hardship and my whole family. And the second son he named Ephraim and said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Then the seven years of abundance in the land of Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began, just as Joseph had said. There was famine in every land, but in the whole land of Egypt there was food. When the whole land of Egypt was stricken with famine, the people cried out to Pharaoh for food. Pharaoh told all Egypt, Go to Joseph and do whatever he tells you. Now the famine had spread across the whole region, So Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Every land came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain, for the famine was severe in every land. This is the word of the Lord. So as we've said, today we reached uh, the end of our time in Genesis for 2023. The chapters we've looked at this year have been the story of the family of Jacob, uh, the account of how God has continued to work out his purposes in this family. The focus mostly has been on one of his sons, Joseph. Over the last two weeks, we've heard of Joseph's hardships. After being sold by his brothers into slavery, he's falsely accused of a crime, thrown into prison where he is forgotten. But remember the all-important phrases that we've heard. The Lord was with Joseph and God alone interprets. Throughout the story of Joseph, God has continued to work his goodwill, directing the course of history for his good purposes. Joseph's a key player in this story, and today we see Pharaoh, another player. But God is the real hero here. How will Joseph respond? Does Joseph set a good example for us to follow as God continues to direct the course of history? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the time we've been able to spend in Genesis this year. Thank you for how we have continued to see your faithfulness, your power and your sovereignty 
in the stories of these people. We ask now that you'd be with us as we come to look at chapter 41. Please guide us by your spirit to grow in our understanding of who you are and your plan for this world, for its past, its present and its future. Amen. So here we are at point two. The chapter begins with the author telling us about a dream or a pair of dreams had by Pharaoh. Now Bernard mentioned to us last week that dreams in ancient Egypt They play an important role in Egyptian culture, that dreams were seen as visitations from the gods, bringing messages. Well, in this case, God is bringing a message to Pharaoh. And we read about the dreams in verses 1 to 7. Here's the message that he's brought to Pharaoh. And boy, does it rattle him. Kids, when you have a dream... Do you often find sometimes you wake up and you just can't shake and you can't get that dream out of your head? Adults, you probably do this too. I mean, I know one for me. When I was little, I used to have this dream behind our lounge in the lounge room. There was a giant black hole and if I went near it, it would suck me behind the lounge and I'd disappear into oblivion. And so I'd wake up the next morning terrified of the lounge in our lounge room. I didn't want to go near it. It rattled me. It really shook me. So I can therefore imagine in some degree how Pharaoh's feeling when he wakes up from this dream. How do we know that it rattled him, though? We'll look at verse 4 and verse 7. He woke up. It's rattled him so much that he's shaken awake from his sleep. What other evidence is there? Have a look at his retelling of the dream to Joseph in verses 17 to 24. Look at the added details that he adds compared with the author's delivery at the beginning of the chapter. Things like, I've never seen such sickly ones as these in all the land of Egypt. And their appearance was as bad as it had been before. You can really picture him there, can't you? It's like when a news reporter reports on a story as opposed to an eyewitness statement. News reporter, very strict to details. Eyewitness very emotional response. Something important for us to remember about Pharaoh, though. This is the most powerful man in all of Egypt. There's no one higher in authority than him. In fact, he and his people even saw him as some sort of God. He would have been sitting very secure in his nation, in his power, his own authority, his own self-righteousness. And then he has this dream that shakes him. He needs God then, doesn't he? He needs God to interpret this dream. Remember, it's only God that can interpret. This takes us to the next point. The Pharaoh doesn't go to God, he goes to his interpreters. He goes to his magicians and his wise men. Those studied up in the science of dream interpretation. But they can't do it. In verse 8, Pharaoh told them his dreams but no one could interpret them. The beginning of the verse says that he was troubled, literally meaning he has a troubled spirit. So you wake up from this shocking dream and you go to your best guys for the interpretation and they can't do it. What does that do for your troubled spirit? It's at this point, though, God, we see God's providence. God intervenes and resurrects the memory in the cupbearer in verse 9. The cupbearer goes on in the next four verses to tell his story to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, clearly at his wit's end with worry, listens, which is a small miracle in itself, and then immediately sends for Joseph. So have a look in verse 14, all these very important action verbs. Pharaoh sent, they quickly brought. He's urgent. Pharaoh wants to know what these dreams mean. Could you then imagine his face then? When in verse 15, he says to Joseph, interpret, and in verse 16, the first thing he hears is, I am not able to. I reckon his mouth would drop, his gut would drop. I think the cupbearer's gut has probably dropped even further. He's not able to? Why did we bring this guy up here then? That's how they're feeling. But what about Joseph? So let's think about Joseph. That morning he's sitting in the dungeon. 
It's been 730 days since the cupbearer left. It's been 30 years since he's been sold by his family as a slave. Things are not great for Joseph at this time. And then, like that, he's taken out of the dungeon, he's cleaned up, he's shaved, he's got new clothes, and now he's standing in front of the king of Egypt. Not only that, but now he's put on the spot. Can you interpret the dreams of the most powerful man in all of Egypt? Does he cave to the pressure? Does he take glory for himself? Does he do what I do and just lie on the ground and cry? What does he do? He confidently denies any power or authority of his own and directs all the honour to God. In the face of pressure, he trusts God and his sovereignty. It is God who will give Pharaoh a favourable answer. Now, in this case, favourable is not meaning the good things that you want to hear, but more, this is a truthful answer that will bring closure. And so, Pharaoh tells Joseph the dreams. And then God's spirit, through Joseph, interprets them for Pharaoh. Seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. Do you notice how in Joseph's interpretation, he has God placed at the beginning and the middle and at the end. In verse 25, God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Verse 28, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Verse 32, the matter has been determined by God and he will carry it out soon. God has decided the course of history. Joseph knows it and trusts the one who is truly in charge. Pharaoh has no impact on it. He's he's just a player. But God is the one who has set the course. But has he left them without a paddle? No, he's sent his message to Pharaoh. He's interpreted it through Joseph. But wait, there's more. Joseph doesn't stop there. He's obviously well read on all of his preaching textbooks because every good sermon needs an application. And so in verses 33 to 36, Joseph lays out a course of action based on the message and its interpretation. When God does what he says he is going to do, this is how you respond and act. And he does this with forthright wisdom. He pits God's wisdom against that of the world. Do you think Joseph would have done something like that when he was back at home with his coloured cloak on? God has grown this man and now he's acting it out. He lives the change that the Lord has made in him. Do we see that in ourselves? Do you see how God has been working in you? And then do you live it? As we saw in 1 Peter, Does your proclamation match your practice? God has promised to be with us, so do we live it? Speaking of promises, that takes us on to point four. God sent the message, Pharaoh listened, God interpreted through Joseph, Pharaoh acted. Now God will fulfill what he promised. The future that he has laid out is about to happen. There are a few layers to this, though. Let's look first at the immediate fulfilment. God sends seven years of plenty to Egypt. Look at verses 47 to 49. There is so much abundance that Joseph stops counting. God has followed through. And he continues to follow through. From verse 53, we see the seven years of abundance end and the seven years of severe famine begin. And it must have been severe. The word famine gets repeated a lot in those last few verses. But it's just as God said it would happen. But there is more fulfilment here than we realise. Let's look in depth at Joseph and his rise to power. In verses 37 to 41, Pharaoh acts by putting Joseph in charge of leading Egypt through the next 14 years. Joseph's no longer in the pit, in the dungeon, in the poverty or the gloom. 
He's now been raised to the second highest position in all of Egypt. He's gone from poverty to prosperity, from gloom to glad, from terrible to terrific. Pharaoh's done a lot for him. He gives Joseph his ring, a symbol of immense power and identity. He clothes Joseph in fine garments. He gives Joseph a gold chain, which is a really great reward. Joseph gets placed in the second chariot, an immense sign of his power and position. But Pharaoh doesn't stop there. Not only has he raised up Joseph, he now tries to Egyptianize Joseph. Sorry, I think that's a word, Egyptianize. Let's go with that. Um, Remember when Joseph was brought before Pharaoh in 14? He's shaved. Hebrews had beards, Egyptians smooth faces. Pharaoh's already beginning to try and Egyptianize him before things have happened. Then in verse 45, Pharaoh gives Joseph an Egyptian name. Pharaoh also gives Joseph an Egyptian wife. Note it's not Joseph taking a wife here. This is Pharaoh giving Joseph a wife. And she is a significant wife. She is Potiphar, the daughter of Potiphar. Uh, and she is a significant aristocratic social standing person, basically a, a position player. Pharaoh is trying to make Joseph as Egyptian as he can. So the pressure on Joseph to conform at this point is pretty extreme. Be one of us. But does Joseph cave? No, he doesn't. Joseph remembers the dreams that God had sent him, that one day his family would bow down to him, before him, that he'll be raised up. He remembers how God has been with him through all the tough times he's faced. He remembers how God has directed his path. Joseph stays true to Yahweh and he acknowledges him and worships him. This is seen in how he applies himself to his work. He doesn't let the power and the position go to his head and sit back and do nothing. He gets out there and he does what he has to do. Another even greater piece of evidence is the naming of his two sons. He gives them Hebrew names, not Egyptian names. He hasn't assimilated into the world he now lives. He still holds to his identity as a child of God. Not only does he name them Hebrew names, but look at their meanings. Manasseh, God has made me forget all my hardship and my whole family. Ephraim, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Who's central in the names? God. Joseph gives all the glory to God in the naming of his sons. He's been through the tough times. He's living in terrific times. Yet he knows the grace God has shown him and acknowledges him for that. Do we do that? Do we praise God in the good times for what he's done? Do we praise God in the tough times for what he's done? Do we worship God in all situations? Like Joseph, we know that God is faithful. We know he is with us. We know he has our future secure, our living hope. Do we acknowledge him for what he has done, is doing, and is going to do, despite the worldly pressures around us to conform. This would have been something I think the original audience of this book, the Israelites about to go into the promised land, probably should have been taking from this passage as they go in and the prospect of these other cultures and other gods. Joseph's a great template for us to follow. Joseph trusted in God's greatness He trusted God's word. He trusted that God was with him. And as such, he humbled himself. He did not cave to the pressures around him. He did not seek his own glory. He gave all the honour and glory to God. So to be very clear, what I'm saying is that if we do as Joseph did, trust God and put him first, 
then we'll all be exalted to second in charge of a great nation, get a really famous and influential wife, and end up with riches and gold and all sorts of good stuff. No, I'm not saying that at all. Please don't hear me wrong. Our reward is not in this world, and it's not a result of what we do. Our reward is eternal. As we learn in 1 Peter, it's an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading. Our eternal future is guaranteed through grace, not by our works. God has promised that. We don't do anything but accept the one who has done that for us as Saviour and Lord. Which leads me on to the final point. Another fulfilment that points forward to God's future workings. The original audience would have remembered the promise made to Abraham in Genesis 12, that one day his family would be a blessing to all nations. Here, Joseph is being that blessing, isn't he? Egypt would have, as verse 36 puts it, been wiped out by the famine. But God, through his grace, brought blessing to Egypt in the person of Joseph, a man in the line of Abraham. Remember in verse 54, there was a famine in every land. Every land at this point is suffering, which is really quite amazing because uh, normally if there's famine in Egypt, there wouldn't be in Canaan at the same time. Their source of water for farming was quite different. So this is a very rare event. But Egypt is being blessed, a nation that is not of the people of God. And then other nations come to Egypt and are blessed because of what God has done and is doing through Joseph. The people of the lands had a great need. They were hungry. They needed food. By God's grace... He sent Joseph to meet that need. Does that description remind you of someone else whose name also starts with J? Joseph points us forward to Jesus, the one who suffered unjustly for a crime he didn't commit, the one who was raised to glory, to whom every knee would bow, the one to whom all nations would come for salvation, the one who would provide for people's greatest need. God has decided the course of history. It's centred around Jesus and his salvation for this world. Will you accept him? Will you listen to him? Will you act on what he says? Will you put him first, honour and acknowledge him at all times and in all situations? There's more to come in the Joseph story. That's for 2024 and maybe even 2025. But for now, as we end our time in Genesis, I think there's two, there's two applications we can draw out from Joseph here. First one, do I put God first? Do I trust him in all situations? Do I see the eternal future he has for me? and serve and worship him with everything I have. And the second one, do I know the suffering, humbled servant that God sent? Do I know the exalted Lord? Do I know the one who has brought true salvation from my greatest problem? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for grace. We thank you for sending Jesus, the true and better Joseph. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you have decided the course of history and that we have a bright future because of what you have done. Please help us to listen to you. Help us to act on what you have taught us. Help us to acknowledge you and honour you in all seasons. And help us to accept the salvation offered us by your grace and that through all this we may bring you glory. Amen.